Good afternoon. Welcome students, alumni, and faculty of Eastern Virginia Medical School, Old Dominion uh, Masters of Public Health program. Today we'll be discussing um, the Certified in Public Health or the CPH credential and why it's important for you to build your resume and invest in your career in public health by obtaining the CPH credential before you enter the workforce. Today we are seeing a trend of employers putting a preference or a requirement in their job postings for the CPH credential. So by taking the CPH while you're in school, um, you'll uh, make yourself more competitive and more marketable against other applicants in the job market. So we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, and this presentation will be about 45 minutes with um, 15 minutes for question and answers. Um, and um, you, if you have questions, you can key them into the right-hand corner of your screen, and I'll um, try to answer as we go along. Um, afterwards, I will email this presentation to you um, as a PDF, um, as a recording, and also um, I'll send you the CPH Candidate Handbook, the um, CPH flyer for um, EVMS with, that has the username and password to the um, free access to the ASPPH CPH study guide um, and the CPH content outline for you. So um, you should expect anybody that registered for this um, should expect that in their email after this presentation. Um, so let's begin. So I'm Kate Brundage. I'm the certification program manager for the public uh, for the National Board of Public Health Examiners. Um, we're in Washington, D.C., and this is our contact information. Again, um, I will be sending this uh, presentation to everybody, so no need to take notes. Um, today we are going to talk about the history um, of MBPHE, um, some statistics and growth, why the CPH benefits and testimonials, our pilot program, and some findings, a snapshot of employers, uh, and these are employers that are seeking the CPH um, credentialed individuals. Um, we're going to talk about the CPH process, so certification overview, eligibility. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, being a student versus an alumni when you sit for the exam and what that means. Um, we'll talk about what's on the exam, um, how, to, how to study for the exam, how we score the exam. We'll talk about study resources, um, the fees and discounts, along with um, we'll wrap up with CPH recertification, so what you need to do after you're certified. So the MBPHE um, and the CPH credential um, is not, the CPH is not just an exam. It is a credential, which means it has a governing board of directors. It has eligibility requirements. It has an, uh, an entrance exam, and it has a recertification process every two years and a code of ethics that all CPH must agree to adhere by. Um, the CPH exam acts as a standard benchmark to measure an individual's grasp of contemporary public health topics, which is um, uh, and the recertification process elevates the public health professional to be on par with other health professional maintenance of their licenses, certification, and credentials. Um, the CPH Code of Ethics, um, which all CPH professionals must uphold and adhere to, assures that essential services are being delivered based on evidence and equity. So, um, how did the CPH come about? So in 1980, the U.S. Surgeon General um, came out with a call to the field to establish a task force for the creation of, um, of a, uh, with a plan to credential public health workers. So um, here's just something you should know, and you probably already do know this, but ASBPH, the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, is the um, is the membership association for schools and programs of public health, such as um, Eastern uh, Virginia Medical School. And APHA is the American Public Health Association, and what they do is they're the membership association for individuals who are involved in public health. So um, eventually, probably sometime in your career, you will probably join uh, and be a member of APHA. Um, and that will give you uh, ways to um, learn about continuing education and uh, stay current in the field and network and um, 
and many other things. So, um, so basically, ASPPH and APHA, um, they had a joint initiative um, where they established um, their own task force to credential public health workers, and um, the, the task force reached out to stakeholders, which um, evolved into a steering committee, and then the executive committee approved the development of an independent uh, board, of, um, board of public health to issue examinations to provide uh, oops, to provide um, uh, an exam for public health to credential public health workers. And then in 2005, the MBPHE was created. Um, the first CPH exam was administered in 2008. Um, the MBPHE Board of Directors is comprised of six uh, executive committee members, um, 13 Board of Director members at large, two honorary uh, members, and two staff members. The following logos represent some of the organizations that employ MBPHE board members, and these members are um, these member organizations support the efforts of MBPHE in credentialing public health professionals. Um, they do this by um, spreading the word of the credential and providing meaningful continuing education opportunities uh, for the community of CPH professionals. So some of these um, organizations that you'll see here. Um, are the American Public Health Association, uh, Association of Prevention and Teaching Research, ASPPH, um, you know, NATO, ASTO, many uh, different organizations in public health. But you'll see that CEPH is, um, C -E -P -H is listed there at the bottom. They are the um, accrediting body that accredits um, schools and programs of public health. So Eastern Virginia Medical School, um, old Dominion University uh, MPH program is uh, CEPH accredited. Therefore, um, the students and alumni are eligible automatically to sit for the CPH exam. So um, since 2008, we have credentialed over 5,600 CPH professionals. We have 500 CPH um, provisional CPHs at any given time, and I'll explain what that means a little bit later. We have 2,000 applicants in the pipeline at any given time. We have 10 schools and programs that require the CPH in order for you to graduate. We have 11 schools and programs who offer a discount for the CPH exam, like Eastern Virginia Medical um, School. And then we have six organizations who strongly encourage um, the CPH exam and offer a discount with free study materials as well. So um, since 2008, you know, we've credentialed 5,600 plus CPHs. Um, we get about 1,200 applications per year. And since 2008, 61 students and alumni from uh, EVMS have sat for the CPH exam. 35 alumni have passed. Four students have passed. And I just, come on, students, don't let the alumni win. So if you're a student, you should prepare for this exam and go ahead and sit for it and pass. <laughs> you can get those numbers up. Um, so why the CPH? The Certified in Public Health um, credential is the only credential of its kind for public health that demonstrates not only your knowledge of key public health sciences, but also your commitment to the field through continuing education focused on emerging and established public health issues. Uh, the number one vision of the MBPHG is to professionalize the field of public health and to raise the visibility of the field itself. We strive to do this by administering the only public health exam that encompasses all core and cross-cutting areas of public health. So we want to create an elite community of certified graduates, working professionals, faculty, and public health um, um, and, and public health leaders, pioneers in the field. Um, uh, we want to, uh, we have a vision that includes a core standard body of knowledge for public health professionals. And lastly, we want to promote continuing education and lifelong learning.
There are many reasons to get certified. Public health professionals need to stay at um, the forefront of their field. This is accomplished by thoroughly understanding the interaction between the different specialized areas of public health, learning new strategies to cope with disasters, and constantly working to stay ahead of any threat. The CPH credential um, helps public health professionals to achieve these evolving goals. So um, I have some testimonials here, but um, basically the CPH shows public health experience by evidencing mastery of core sciences of public health. It demonstrates commitment to public health beyond your academic training. So if somebody is, um, it's, it's also being used as a hiring tool. So if somebody has a resume that is exactly the same as yours, an MPH or a DRPH, and you have the CPH and they don't, you're going to get the job. It means that you took time to study and prepare on your own and go on the weekend, on your free weekend, and sit for an exam to show that you're serious about public health. So it certifies your commitment to the field. It raises the bar in public health by uh, increasing pro uh, professionalism, creates more awareness of the importance of quality public health workforce, and um, makes you stay current on best practices. I'm going to stop and see if we have any questions real quick. OK, we don't have any questions. So I'm going to go on. I'm going to talk about our pilot program. This is important to you because we opened up our eligibility to include individuals that have work experience plus a bachelor's degree. So we have um, basically opened up the, the exam for the workforce. And um, we had a pilot, and we tried it in 2015. And um, you know, the applications flooded the office, and um, we certified, uh, there's about 800 applications, and um, so we decided to make it a permanent eligibility criteria. So now individuals who have a bachelor's degree plus um, five years of public health work experience are eligible to sit for the CPH exam. Um, we're starting to see that the United States Public Health Service are sending many of their members and uh, employees, the Army nurse. Core um, APHA is giving a discount for all of their members um, to sit for the exam. So why is this important to you? While you're in school, um, these individuals are actually out in force, and they're earning this credential. And more employers are seeing it. They're saying, hey, what's that? Um, they're now reimbursing for professional development fees. So going and sitting for the exam, your boss might reimburse you. Your boss also might promote you or give you a salary um, a, a salary increase. Some other things, it might make you more marketable on your resume. Um, but, you know, um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, I have a little quote here from Diane Matjax. And she says, as a public health administrator in both local and state health departments, I often was responsible for hiring decisions. I found a great deal of variability in the form and content of graduate degrees in public health. The CPH credential uh, is a credential recognizable by employers, and it provides insurance that, assurance that an applicant possesses a solid knowledge base in core public health content areas routinely used in practice in health departments. So what do these um, organizations all have in common? Uh, you'll see many of these organizations are heavily involved in um, public health. You'll see APHA, CDC, NHO, um, and uh, ASPPH. Oh. Oh. My computer just froze. Sorry, one second. Sorry, guys. We're going to have to wait for one second. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Okay. Sorry, guys. 
One second. Okay, so basically all of these organizations want all of their employees to get CPH certified. Um, we're starting to see more uh, organizations are coming to us and say, saying that they want their entire department certified, and so um, we're seeing large groups are going ahead and, and promoting the credential within the organizations that um, they work at. So evidence of mastery in core sciences, uh, core skills and knowledge. Um, this is Tanya Smith. She's a lieutenant from the United States Public Health Service, and she was a member of our pilot cohort. She passed the CPH uh, exam, and she said that, though I don't hold an MPH, I bring many years of invaluable real-world public health experience to the table. I reviewed the ASPPH CPH study guide, as well as other study resources. Three months later, I successfully passed the first exam to be offered to candidates based solely on prior work experience, and it has been my, uh, one of my proudest professional accomplishments. Um, salary increases in promotions. Uh, this is Laura E. Ricardo from the Army Nurse Corps. And she says that once I received my passing notice of the CPH exam, I received an 80,000 incentive bonus offered at that time in four increments, and I have continued to proudly serve my commission. So you have the opportunity for salary increases and promotions um, by earning a credential, like the CPH. And so um, it also proves that you have met and can maintain a national standard in public health. So Patrick Harper just says that my CPH affirms that I possess the means to positively change lives, and it motivates me to, to remain dedicated to doing just that. I accept this challenge proudly in honor of my fellow CPH certified colleagues, my branch of service, and most importantly, the nation whose health I have sworn to protect, promote, and advance. So employers are actively seeking for um, seeking CPH professionals right now to work in public health. They're either putting a preference or a requirement, a requirement in their job postings. Um, and so uh, as a student who might be interested in looking for work after school or if you're an alumni on the call and you are looking for work, uh, you could check out ASPPH's publichealthjobs.org. Um, it's just publichealthjobs.org. But um, there are many jobs on there. They're all only specific to public health. And all of these schools, uh, oh, I'm sorry, all of these organizations right here listed um, are organizations that are currently um, requiring or preferring the CPH in order to work um, for them. Okay, the CPH process. The CPH process begins with eligibility. So you need to determine whether you're eligible to sit for the exam under the four pathways that we have. I'm not going to go, I'll go through them quickly because I know that you guys are already eligible. But basically, all students and alumni of CEPA accredited schools and programs of public health are eligible to sit for the CPH exam. Um, I see that there's a question. Um, and we will get to that in one second. So um, this, the CE, uh, so eligibility, the students and alumni of CEPA accredited schools and programs of public health are eligible to sit for the exam, um, as well as working professionals. Uh, the exam is 200 questions with um, 12 domain areas, and then you recertify and you assign the code of ethics every two years. We're also a proud member of the Institute for Credentialing Excellence. Um, there was a quick question about whether um, the difference between the CPH and the CHES. Um, I can see if I get the question right. So, uh, she was wondering, uh, Linda is wondering um, what the difference is between the Certified Health Education Specialist Certification and the CPH. Well, the Certified Health Education Specialist is a, is a credential that you would earn if you plan to be faculty or a teacher or a professor of public health. If you're interested in doing um, you know, more broader things, um, if you're interested in, in epidemiology or being a biostatistician um, or um, 
you know, it, uh, the CPH basically is cradled as great public health. It, it's like um, the overarching credential for public health. So if you want to be more broader and like um, say that you have mastered all the whole area of public health, then go ahead and take the CPH. But if you uh, would prefer to be more specialized and, and go for uh, teaching, then you would want to take the CHES. Okay, um, and another question was, would it be beneficial to have um, both degrees? And I assume she means both credentials, but um, um, yes, it's always good to have both, sure, but um, I would, I mean, if it was up to me, I would go with the one um, that is more um, overarching rather than specialized. Um, however, you know, it's, it's your call. However, um, while your school is offering it to you, you should jump on board. Um, for the CPH, but so Eastern Virginia Medical School is offering a discount for their alumni to sit for the CPH exam. Uh, all graduates are eligible. All students are eligible to sit for the exam who are enrolled in the core courses of BioSAT, um, epidemiology, environmental health, health policy management, and social and behavior sciences. Um, and we already talked about um, those working individuals, the new category, but so the um, difference between provisional, provisionally certified and active. When a when a student actually, there's one question. We'll answer that right before I. Okay, so there's um, a difference between those who students and when a student sits for the exam and when an alumni sits for the exam. So when a student sits for the when an alumni sits for the exam and they pass, they're automatically an active CPH. They'll get their username and password to the CPH recertification portal. They'll be able to put CPH behind their name. They will um, have their certificate sent to them um, by mail. They'll get a link for a virtual certificate that they can link to their LinkedIn, um, like tons of different things. You'll, you'll, oh, and we'll place you on the um, search for CPH registry. So when a student sits for the exam and passes, um, you are going to be provisionally certified. So you'll get a username and a password to your portal to view your scores, but there will be a letter in there that says, hey, you're provisionally certified, which means you can't really accumulate CE credits. You can't start accumulating recertification credits until you graduate. So when you graduate, your school will log into our system and verify your graduation date. And when they do that, it sends me an email to say, hey, go ahead and um, certify Linda. So I will go ahead and um, create her certificate and, and change her status to active, and there you go, she'll be certified. But that's the difference. Um, so the CPH exam, it covers um, uh, general principles. Oh, you'll have 25 items in general principles. In the core areas, you'll have 30 items in biostatistics, 30 items in epidemiology, 30 items in environmental health sciences, again, 30 items in health policy and management, and the same 30 items in social and behavioral sciences. And then you'll have this category called cross-cutting, which you'll have 25 items in cross-cutting, and that will be communications and informatics, diversity and culture, leadership, professionalism, program planning, public health biology, and systems thinking. Okay, so it's a timed exam. There's 200 questions. You have four hours to sit for the exam. You're not allowed any calculators or scratch paper. However, I have been told that um, you don't need to do any math, any difficult math. It's uh, mostly recognizing formulas, <clears throat> um, uh, and, and yeah, recognizing formulas. And all questions are multiple choice and single best answer. So your exam, exam options. I'm going to see if there's a question first, and then we'll go into that. Um.
Okay, so um, there are two ways to sit for the exam. There's computer-based and then there's paper-based. So really the only time you're ever going to sit for the exam paper-based is if um, EVMS decides that they want to hold a paper-based exam on the campus, which they have done before. So if you guys are interested in that, go ahead and mention it to your program administrator. Um, and uh, we could set up the paper and pencil examination um, and you guys could all sit for the exam together and, um, and then your scores would be mailed to you a few weeks later. Or we have a um, computer base. So we offer the computer based test during um, the whole month of February, the whole month of June, and the whole month of October. However, we may, there are rumors <laughs> that we may be offering the exam all year round soon. So you may be able to take it by the computer anytime you want. Um, however, you could just go to our website, key in your zip code to find the closest testing location, um, testing center, and the you would um, drive there, sit for the exam, and then your exam scores would be printed off for you after you after you hit submit on your exam. Um, so computer-based exam, you're going to find a testing location near your home. It includes instant scoring, so you know right then and there whether you failed or passed. And then the other thing is you have 72 hours to reschedule um, or register for the exam. Um, Paper-based exams are a little bit different. You have 30. You have to register 30 days in advance. Um, they're really strict on that. I don't know why, but you have to register 30 days in advance. Um, if you guys ever did do a paper and pencil, I would try to remind you and send you emails to, hey, the deadline's coming up. Don't forget to um, register. But typically, people do computer-based. However, um, one more thing that I wanted to mention is that paper-based doesn't include instant scoring. You'll receive your scores a few weeks later in the mail. All right. So how is the exam scored? Each item is examined for its performance and its difficulty. Um, and uh, it's, there's a content-based analysis um, that determines the minimum passing standard to require um, to a minimum passing standard required to achieve certification. So, so the CPH exams are created using multiple choice test items drawn from a CPH item bank. And then the MVPHG selects faculty and practitioners each year to write new items for this item bank. And the item writers are trained on how to write items for standardized exams. They're given uh, specific assignments based on deficits in the item bank and their particular area of expertise. Um, so we have you know, committees that are constantly examining these questions for reliability, saying, hey, everybody got question five wrong. Maybe it's too easy, or hey, everybody's getting this one wrong. Maybe it's too hard, or maybe it's not written correctly. You know, so we're constantly reviewing the questions um, with the committee, and it's handled on a pass/fail basis. And the pass rate is more than seventy-five percent. There is a question, so I'm going to see one second. Um, so there is a question that how long does it take to um, get certified once you pass the exam? Um, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but basically if you're alumni and you pass the exam, the minute um, uh, our testing vendor sends us the scores and we import them into our system, you will be certified. Um, it usually takes about, I don't know, maybe a week or two. Um, but the wait period for retake is, um, there is no wait period for retaking. You can retake. Um, as many times as you would like and as often as you would like, um, which we will get to. But uh, just one more thing about test development is that you know we we uh, we have an item bank analysis and we train the we train the volunteers and they write questions and then we have an item review committee that reviews the forms uh, or I'm sorry reviews all the items and then we have a form review committee that reviews the whole test as an, as a whole. And then there's a post-test item analysis done, and then the passing score is set. So that's a little bit, it gets kind of crazy, but that's a little bit about how the test is developed. And if you have any more questions and you want more detail on that, I'd be happy to um, send you my supervisor's information. She loves test development. <laughs> All right, so score reporting. Um, candidates who pass the computer-based Test are going to receive their passing notice, their their um their passing status immediately. You know their scores are going to be printed out for them. They'll know whether they pass or fail. It'll just be a percentage. Whereas um 
uh, students or alumni who fail are going to receive that same score report. However, it's going to be scaled scoring. So it's going to say, like, you know, it'll give you a percentage of what you did, how you did in epidemiology. It'll give you a percentage of how you did in uh, health policy and management. So that way you can kind of gauge, oh, I didn't really do that good in social and behavioral sciences. Maybe I should study more. So um, in that area. So um, it kind of lets you know where you need to um, study more. And then the schools and programs receive these scores. And what they do is um, they use them to evaluate how they're building their curricula. You know, if, if all of their students are not doing very well in epidemiology, then they know that they need to beef up that section. And so that's how these like um, score reports are kind of being used mm -hmm. these days. Like at the University of South Florida, um, they're using these to kind of um, beef up their curricula. Um, so registering for the exam. All right, so how to apply for the exam. So when you go to our website, um, you're going to see register now. And when you click on it, it will take you to a page that looks like this. Well, it might. We're kind of redesigning everything right now. But basically, you're going to see a, a button that says either apply now or register now. You go there, and you'll pick student and alumni. Uh, you don't want to pick the, the work eligibility. It's a different ap application. So you'll pick student and alumni. And, um, our testing vendor is PSI. So when you select that student and alumni, it's going to kick you over to our, our uh, testing vendor's website. And that's where you'll create an account online. From there, um, after you select Eastern Virginia Medical School in the um, drop down, it's going to recognize that you guys are a group that is participating in the discount program. So it will uh, register that you pay. Um, the, the discounted price for the exam. Um, and what will happen is after you register um, and you pay, um, your school will get an email to log into our system and verify that yes, you, um, you are either a student or yes, you uh, are an alumni of their school. And once they verify that piece of information in our system, it'll automatically generate an email to you to prompt you to log into the system and to um, schedule your exam. Um, one thing I want to note is that the first time you register for the exam and then you need to reschedule, you have to reschedule within 72 hours of the exam. And the other thing is um, the first reschedule is free. The second reschedule is $125. And then every reschedule after that is an additional $125. So when you're getting ready to um, sit for the exam, just make sure that it's on a date that, you, that you're comfortable with and that you know you can make. Um, uh, you know, in order to not have to have that second time fee. Um, so again, here's uh, here's the information about um, PSI. So basically, once you create an account uh, with them and your education is verified and you schedule your exam, you have two years to sit for the exam. You have two years of eligibility. Um, and all of rescheduling, all scheduling, any kind of deferrals, um, if something happened, um, some, some uh, unseen circumstances, um, you couldn't make the exam, you would send them the paperwork and um, they would work it out with you. They would work out the rescheduling with you. So basically, um, their phone number is there and you will have this information so you can contact them at any time. However, I'm always here if you need me to intervene or if you need me to, you know, um, if anything is if anything's needed at all, I, I'm here for you. So um, again, there's that reschedule information just because I hate when people find out that it's 125 and they don't know. So retaking the exam, uh, you can take it as many times as you like. There's no limit on how many, um, how often candidates can retest. And again, currently our testing windows for computer-based are February, June, and October. However, I heard a rumor from a little bird that we might be switching to all your round testing soon. So CPH study resources. We have the content outline, we have sample exam questions, we have a practice exam, and we have webinars. So um, here's the CPH content outline. Why is this important? If it's on here, it's on the exam. So basically, this is your map. I think it's like 17 pages, 16 pages. It's your map. If it's on there, then that means a question correlates to that part of the outline. Um, so you want to make sure that every part of that content outline you can speak to. Um, and 
uh, it's free to you on the website. You can just, oh, and I'm also going to send it to you after this presentation. So um, we also have sample questions. I think there are 13 of them. Um, it's basically just to show you kind of the format, um, mostly. And so we also have practice exams. We have three different practice exams. One's 100 questions, and then the other two are 50 questions um, a piece. Those are free as well. So all of our study materials are free to you, um, except for the ASPPH CPH study guide, which um, actually is free to you because you're Eastern Virginia Medical School and um, Old Dominion University uh, MPH program. So because you guys are students and alumni, you're going to get a discount on the exam and um, the free study guide. So this is what the study guide looks like currently. Um, Actually, that's an old picture. I'll have to update that. But um, so there's overviews with each area. There's suggested readings. Um, there's definitions and terminology, sample questions, um, and again, that 100 question practice test and the 250 question practice test. Uh, I think they live within the study guide. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. But this there's also study tips. But um, this is the uh, password that you will need to access the study guide for free. And I will send this to you. But what I would do is log in with the discount code. You have to go to the website. You have to create an account and use the discount code that's highlighted there in orange to uh, get free access to the study guide. And I would print out the content outline and just start making notes and going through and seeing if this is something that you think you could pass. And if, some, if this is something you think you're dedicated enough to do. Um, uh, and we also have webinars. We have three hour long webinars on each of the core areas. And again, these are free to you on the website. Um, we just had one today in environmental health. Um, but we record them every January. Um, they're free to listen to. They're on our website. And after you're certified, if you find that you're lacking credits and you just don't know what to do, you can listen to all of these webinars. And that's like 18 credits right there. OK. Um, so in 2017, um, actually annually, every year at APHA, the American Public Health Association, um, we, um, we hold a two-day learning course called the CPH Learning Institute. And um, this is a two-day learning course that's eight hours a day each day. It goes over all the core areas um, with experts, um, subject matter experts. And then on the third day, you sit for the CPH um, exam by paper and pencil. So it's kind of just something like, fun you can do while you're at the APHA event or conference. And again, like if you're serious about um, public health and you really want to be in this field, you're eventually going to get a membership to APHA. And so you'll be going to these conferences. So um, also, I think they might have a student membership. So we'll plug for them. <laughs> but um, all right, so we have some schools and programs that are requiring or strongly encouraging the CPH exam, like I mentioned. So just to show you here, these are the schools and programs that are requiring you to sit for the exam for graduation. Okay. And then these are the schools and programs that have significant CPH participation. And you'll see that EVMS is um, right there in the upper right-hand corner. Um, we also have University of Texas El Paso as of yesterday. I just haven't had time to add it. So the organizations with significant CPH participation are um, listed here. As I told you before, like Army Public Health Centers, giving their um, all of their um, individual, all their personnel and employees and members um, a discount on the exam. Same with the Army Nurse Corps and the Navy Nurse Corps, Commissioned Officers Association, United States Public Health Service, APHA. And then if you're an ASPPH fellow, um, you as well can get a discount for the exam. Prices and discounts. The standard fee is 385, but organizations or schools and programs that have about 20 to 30 percent of their student body set for the exam um, earn a discount of 315 for their students, and you can um, access the study guide for free. Um, those schools that require the exam pay 250. All right, guys. Let's see. I got 15 minutes, so um, let me just check and see if there are any questions. Doesn't look like it, so we're almost there. Um, so after you sit for the CPH exam and you pass, <laughs> um, you have to recertify every two years. Um, let 
we have an online reporting portal. Um, and you self-report your credits in um, your personalized individualized portal where um, your scores will live and, um, and many other things. But you have to report 50 CPH recertification credits every two years and pay the $95 maintenance fee every two years. Um, and so some of the certification activities that you can do include college courses, so, you know, if you earn this, um, do, um, if you get the CP, if you pass the CPH while you're in school and you're provisionally certified and then you graduate and we send you your, your information to track credits in the system, um, you could track your last couple semester, your last semester of courses as recertification credits. So you're already kind of ahead because um, one public health course um, anything related to public health, like a course, would uh, count for 15 credits. So that's a lot. Um, then conferences and professional events, um, that's one, our typical rule of thumb is one CPH credit per one hour of attendance. So um, uh, up to eight hours a day. So if you attend any of these uh, conferences and network and all of those sorts of things, you can earn um, continuing education credits that will go towards CPH recertification. Same thing if you're teaching or volunteering, sitting on a board or a committee, if you write questions for the CPH exam, or if you write questions for the CPH um, study guide, um, uh, medical residencies, dissertations, um, there's many things, podcasts, webinars, lots of things you can do, um, many free things too, so it, it doesn't have to cost money. Um, so this is what the portal looks like at the, at the moment. Um, and you'll see here that you can, at the bottom left hand, you can find credits and providers, you can report your activity, you can request an extension, and you can see your recertification history. There's a pie here, and it says total credits required 50, and it's all full because it says other credits, you'll see it says 54. Now, what does that mean? So you can, um, we allow you to report credits that aren't pre-approved. Like the National Board of Public Health Examiners approves certain organizations like CDC and like FDA to, um, uh, to uh, um, when they put on their courses and their webinars, um, they, they're pre-approved for um, CPH recertification. But if you attend an event that isn't pre-approved and you want credit for it, um, either A, we can contact that, or I'll be happy to contact the organization to ask them if they'd like to become a pre-approved provider of CPH recertification credits, but also you can count it. Um, we don't, you know, we're, you're allowed to count things that are not pre-approved. As long as they relate to public health in some way, we don't, you know, it's not a big deal. As long as you're doing things in public health, that's what we care about. Um, you can see at the top, um, you can see my certification tab is basically your score report. The my profile tab is if you have to update your contact information. There's a user manual, frequently asked questions. You'll see under the name Cynthia Pewitt there are digital badges, um, and then we will talk about that one in a second. So um, within the portal, you can find credits. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, but some pre-approved providers are listed here. Like if you went to the Association of Public Health Nurses um, conference up in San, San Diego in a couple of months, um, you know, you could count credit for that. Um, you can, you know, anything related to public health. And also, it doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't have to be just biostatistics, epidemiology. It can be professionalism or leadership. So I can go and sit for another certification for Six Sigma, which has nothing to do with public health, but it has to do with leadership and professionalism. And I can count 10 CPH recertification credits for earning that. So there's a lot of flexibility. Um, and our goal is to increase engagement of CPHs. Um, and we do that with digital badges. And digital badges are visual representation of a skill or achievement. And, um, you know, some people are like, well, why does that matter? You know, yeah, I have these badges in my portal and whatever. But the thing is, when you go to our um, find a CPH registry, if an employer goes to our find a CPH registry and types in your last name to verify that you are a CPH professional, those badges will show up and they might say, hey, that's kind of interesting. Uh, we should hire her. She has all these digital badges. And 
Um, I can I think there's a slide in here that kind of explains it a bit more. But also, um, we're implementing virtual certificates. And these virtual certificates will, um, you'll have a unique URL that will link to your LinkedIn. And um, it, it can be in your email signature as well. And basically employers can, you give employers this URL and when they click on it, they'll see your certificate and they'll know that you're certified. Um, and so this can live in your resume. Um, and yes, here's the digital badges. So it's like superstar attendee, star presenter, mass, um, you know, lifelong learner, um, and you'll see that the gray badges symbolize that, you know, you attended uh, more above and beyond, but then the green one is you went even beyond, and then, of course, the one that has the, the border around it is, you know, you went nuts. Um, so find a CPA to registry is, uh, it looks like this, and so an employer, let's say they, uh, Deborah Barnes, Josiah, um, they typed in her name, and they this comes up, and they see that they see her number, her MBPHG number, which is like her CPH number. Um, they'll see that she's active. Uh, they'll see her digital badges, and then she they can also print her actual certificate cover letter, which is an official letter that says, "Hey, this person's certified," and through these dates and that sort of thing. It's kind of neat. Um, also, here's an example of the CPH certificate that you'll receive by mail out uh, embossed with the, um, the seal. Um, we also have CPH merchandise. You know, you can buy a bag, a mug. Uh, I like the notebooks, but uh, I think there's hoodies, everything. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then we also have Facebook and LinkedIn. So we have a Facebook group that's open to um, everybody, anybody. Um, but our LinkedIn group is, is special just for CPH professionals. It's a closed group. And so we post things within that group that, you know, you guys are interested in. Like, hey, there's a conference coming up in your area. You know, maybe you should go um, to get recertification credits. Or, hey, did you know this? Or we're nominating um, or self-nominate yourself to become a board member, what have you. Like, you know, it, it's more um, geared towards CPH professionals. Oh, you're also going to get a CPH weekly newsletter from me. Um, with all kind of news updates and um, um, and recertification opportunities. Uh, and I just threw this in here, but the next um, computer-based uh, CPT exam is June 1 through 30 at the um, time being. You know, we might go to all year round testing, so um, stay tuned. But at the time being, um, the next exam is in June. So if you're interested, please sign up. And if you need any help at all, please contact me. I'm happy to help. So I see that there are some questions. Let's go ahead and do that. we got 10 minutes left. Um, So somebody asked if they should wait till their final um, semester to take the exam, and I've heard that that's wise. That's what I've heard um, many um, uh, many of the faculty suggest, and um, many of uh, the students have like that's the trend. You know, um, usually they wait until their second year to sit for it to get all the information um, because you can't enroll. You have to be, like, if you enroll in all the courses, then you can sit for the exam as a student. However, like, if you are new and you're just enrolled in biostatistics and you're not enrolled in the core, you can't sit for the exam. So you have to at least be enrolled in the core. And so it would be better to at least take the exam when you're closer to the end of the semester, I suppose, you know, so you have the knowledge. Um, and another person asked about, public, like launching a public health webinar or speaking presentation type of um, university. And yeah, there's a way to become pre-approved and I'd be happy to send you information on that. Um, it's on our website under pre, uh, becoming a pre-approved provider. Um, and I'd be happy to talk with you offline about that. Um, I heard, oh, the pass rate is 75%. So 75% of people that take our CPH exam pass on the first try. And let's see, are there any other questions? Okay, well, it doesn't seem like there are any other questions. Um, 
I want to thank you very much for um, attending my presentation. Um, I hope you sit for the exam, and if you have any questions at all, please contact me. I am happy to help, and I will go ahead and get you guys uh, this presentation after it is converted, and I will get um, all those documents to you. So go ahead and please have a great day. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining. Goodbye.